everybody. So we have an award-winning author, journalist, and celebrated podcaster joining us today. Now, her latest book is Magpie. It's an entertaining thriller that brings attention to the topic of fertility. It also reflects some of the author's own fertility journey. Elizabeth Day is here to talk to us about her book and what it was like to write about such a really personal topic, one that's usually a private struggle for so many women. Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. And Cynthia, thank you for dressing in tandem with the book jacket. Oh, I really appreciate it. Oh, <laughs> nice touch. You know, that's what I come here for, <laughs> to do that. <laughs> well, Elizabeth, uh, a huge congratulations. Your book is receiving so much praise, so many wonderful reviews. Uh, this is now your fifth novel. So tell us a bit about the book and your inspiration to write it. Well, thank you so much for the compliment in the question. Yeah, it's been great to see Magpie finding its way stateside. And really, I came to write it because, as you mentioned there, it is a book that deals with themes of infertility in what I hope is a compelling and accessible way. But I had gone through a decade of infertility struggles myself, and I really wanted to write the kind of book that I would have liked to have read when I was going through the early stages of that because I don't think it's an experience that is widely reflected in fiction. And so that was the starting point. And then I came up with the idea for a big, big old plot twist, because as a reader, I love a plot twist. I find them such entertaining facets of fiction. So I wanted to make a book that was thrilling to read, but that also explored some really serious and necessary issues. I like the way you teased that. It was very nice. Um, you've spoken about uh, your own fertility journey and uh, that you did incorporate some of that experience into Magpie. Uh, did that make it more difficult to write or was it in some ways sort of a cathartic or therapeutic experience? Mm -hmm. It did actually end up being incredibly cathartic and therapeutic, partly because I was writing it during the first national lockdown here in the UK. And to have something every single day that I could return to that gave my days a sort of rhythm and flow was immensely helpful to my own mental health, as was the fact that I was putting into words experiences that so often remain silent, because I think so many women and a few men feel a misplaced sense of shame around topics such as miscarriage or IVF. And I really am passionate about destigmatizing these subjects so that we can all be open and share a bit more and we can all understand a bit more what we're going through. So the process of doing that for myself was actually really, really helpful. But that's not to say that there weren't some some moments, some evenings when uh, I, I would definitely feel quite sad and emotional. But that's where I think the joy of fiction comes in. Like all the best truth should make you feel something. Mm, that's a really powerful statement. Well, oftentimes um, when we do speak of uh, a fertility journey, we are generally focusing on how it is affecting a woman. But in your book, we actually see the emotional impact that it has on men as well through her partner in the story, which is really, really interesting novel in many ways. So how important was it for you to highlight the male perspective in your book? It was really, really important. And I'm so glad you picked up on that because there are three main characters in this book. There is Marissa, who's in her late 20s, who meets Jake after lots of dispiriting online dating. He seems to tick every single one of her boxes. They move in together and they start trying for a family together quite quickly. And at this point, they also take in a lodger because Jake's job isn't going that well, so they can't make ends meet. And it's really the interplay between the three of them. But it was very, very important for me to look at how Jake might be responding to some of this because, again, a woman going through fertility has a physical response and it's often her body that is experiencing the greatest physical trauma. But for a man watching, and I'm talking about a very heteronormative cisgendered setup here, but a man watching that can't experience it physically himself. So where does he put his grief? How does he express it? And I think it's one of those things that's really overlooked in society as a whole. So I really wanted to be kind to Jake in my writing as well and to explore a bit of that ambivalence. Mm. You just mentioned the physical toll that a fertility journey uh, can take on the body. Uh, one situation involves a medically induced miscarriage at home. Why was it important for you to include that in the book and to show the reality, the physical reality of the experience? Well, I mean, I hope this isn't too much information for your viewers, but I started writing Magpie straight after my third miscarriage, which was a medically managed one, which I endured at home during the first lockdown. And it was 
by far and away the worst of my three miscarriages. And I had never read about one. And I didn't know where to go to look for information on what I was experiencing and whether it was normal. And Google was relatively helpful, but I really wanted my fiction to reflect that truth that very human experience. And I think, you know, you both will know that the female experience so often gets marginalized in mainstream culture. Mm -hmm. We're so used to seeing male violence, particularly in movies, but we're not that used to seeing, you know, just female everyday experiences like menstruation. The blood that we see is sort of violent. It's not one that's bodily. And so I really wanted to challenge that. And I, I think that Magpie comes from all of that from quite a feminist perspective. Um, and I wanted to honor that experience really as part of life and to make other people feel less alone. Yeah, again, so, so powerful. Another um, theme that you chose to handle in the book, and I think with great care as well, is that of mental illness. So why did you choose to bring it into the novel the way that you did um, in relation to a fertility journey? Well, I think that anyone who has undergone a fertility journey or indeed the early days of motherhood has probably felt that their own mental health has come in for a battering because it is a really, really difficult, painful process and it unmoors what you think you know about life. And so I wanted to make the point that actually we all in certain ways have have our own struggle with mental health. I, I feel like mental health is part of being human and I wanted to encompass that without othering it. So it was very, very important for me to do my research properly, to uh, convey a sensitive and accurate portrayal. And I'm very lucky in that respect in that my father's a surgeon. So I got lots of inside information about you know, the medical reality of that. And I think for me, it's all part of honoring the human experience. For me, there, there's no such thing as an unlikable character. There's a character that I have to explain as a novelist. Mm. You explore so many different areas of the human experience. And one of them is fear of abandonment and being alone, which I think is something that is so relatable, particularly for those who've undergone a fertility journey. Um, why, let's talk about, you know, why it was so important to address this in, in the book. Well, I think, again, for many people, there is this idea, especially if you're like me and you grew up on a diet of 1980s rom-coms, <laughs> I felt like my life was going to pan out in a certain way and it would involve a very conventional marriage and it would involve two children and all of that would happen really easily. And actually, my experience was it didn't happen easily and I was left with this innate fear of ending up alone. There was this kind of existential fear around loneliness and, as you say, abandonment. And so it was a lens through which to look at that. What happens if the quote-unquote perfect life actually is never within your grasp? What happens if you have to come to terms with the imperfect, with the flawed reality? And what fulfillment can you find in that, in that path? Because I think we live in an age of curated perfection, right? We live in an age where we're constantly comparing our insides, our neuroses, with everyone else's external picture-perfect life, where they're posting holiday snapshots or bikini selfies and that can make you feel very alone and so this book in many ways I it was an antidote to loneliness both for me as I was writing it and I hope to the reader mm -hmm. I know I'm sounding really serious and I just want to I just want to <laughs> reassure your viewers that there are some laughs in this book too <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm going to turn this ship around that you just turned around one more time because you do actually have the theme of failure that really is a thread through a lot of things that you have done specifically your very highly popular podcast called How to Fail um, and it's speaks to this very topic. But as women, we often see infertility or we equate it with some kind of failure. And so what advice would you give to women going through this journey about overcoming this idea like we're just so inadequate if you can't conceive? Oh, that's such a fantastic point. And I have to say that a lot of our medical terminology is geared up. It is the language of failure when you're going through fertility treatment. So I was constantly told by predominantly male consultants that I was failing to respond to the drugs. A friend of mine was told that she had an incompetent cervix. Someone else Oof. I know was told that they had an, an inhospitable womb. This is a vocabulary that I don't think would be used of any medical condition other than fertility. And I think it's baked into a sort of 
ingrained sense that women's health issues aren't as important. They're very marginalized. And the advice that I would give for anyone going through it is to trust your instincts to know yourself and to know that you are so strong and you are such a warrior for going through this. And every single step you're going through is preparing you for parenthood in, in ways that you can't even imagine. And I also would love to quote my friend Fran, who when I told her I was being told I was failing to respond to drugs, she said to me this really mind-blowing thing for me at the time. She said, Maybe you're not failing to respond to the drugs. Maybe the drugs are failing you. And I think that that's a really important thing to remember. You are not a failure just because you fail. All you are is human and you're getting stronger every single time you fail and you bounce back from that failure. Mm. You learn resilience, you learn wisdom. And you know what? I actually wouldn't have had my journey any other way because I've learned so much and I've encountered so many other phenomenal women and men along this path. Mm. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you so much. Everyone watching Elizabeth's book, Magpie, is out now. It's a great read. Be sure to pick up a copy and we'll be right back. <laughs>